Hello, can you hear me? Good. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many people here on this cold, chilly night. And thank you to John Doan for that music. He'll be back later at the evening edition. Get the mic closer. Is that better? Better. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, this festival is sponsored by the Washburn Heritage Association and the Washburn Area Historical Society. Can you hear me back there now? Yes. Okay, Christy, I guess we have to talk loud and get to keep the mic close, huh? Um, and here's a big thank you to the Washburn Community Education Foundation for supporting this winter series. As you know, the music... The musician this evening is John Doan, and he's sponsored by the Historical Society. And we hope you will stay after the presentation for more music and refreshments. Here's a big thank you to Betty Ferris for providing technical assistance for Christy tonight. Yep. And uh, finally, we hope that you can join us on February 20th to see the PBS video Ojibwe Oral Tradition and hear the filmmaker Lorraine Norgard and Ojibwe language expert Andy Goki from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And thank you to the Harbor View for hosting us again tonight. We are really fortunate to have with us Kristen Lippard. Christy moved to Washburn from Hawaii about almost 12 years ago. She said it was on Mother's Day with her husband, Dennis, and son and daughter. And in the true Lippard fashion, they immediately left into the community and have been very big contributors ever since. Christy is the Development Director for Northern Light Services and is also the Senior Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at Northland College. She has worked in nonprofit organizations in rural communities as a grant writer, a program director, and a fundraiser for more than 20 years. People who know her know she is known for her fun and friendly manner, for her big collaboration skills, and for her conscientious and positive approach to whatever is in front of her. So let's welcome Christy. Okay. Well, before I get started, this, you know what it, you know why you're here. We're going to do the history of uh, Northern Lights and the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital, but it goes back much further than that. And so I thought it would be more fun since this is a, a hosted event by our historical friends that we're going to go all the way back a hundred years. But before we do that, not everyone in here goes back a hundred years. <laughs> Although I know some people that go back a hundred years now. Um, but I'd like you to stand if you have. If you are currently involved as a staff or a board member at Northern Lights, if you were ever an employee of the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital or the Washburn Hospital, stand up, please. Okay, thank you for your service. And the reason I had you stand, can you hear me okay, Sharon? Yeah. Okay. The reason, sorry. The reason I had you stand is that I want to let you know ahead of time that as, as I was introduced, I've been here 12 years, so I'm a newcomer to this community. And everything I learned, I learned through the help of other people. But you guys all may have more stories and more information than even I do. So I have chocolate rewards for anybody who can add to or correct me if I've done something a little off kilter from what you know about the history. Because the goal was that we would come together tonight and we would all learn something and we would all be able to share a little bit. So hopefully that will happen and that's the goals of this uh, program tonight. So the, president, uh, the presentation will cover a time frame from the 1880s through today and how Washburn has really taken care of its own people, the medical needs of its people that whole time. It's a history to be proud of for certain and a legacy of care. And you'll find, as I did, that Washburn has remained and will continue to be very responsive to the needs of its community. And I want to thank a few people. Special thanks to Susan McCrath at the Cultural Center because she has put up with me and now some of my friends over the couple weekends <laughs> in digging through the past. Also for Sandy Olson and Sandy Johnson who got me up here and also who have been really helpful and wrote a fair bit of the text that I'm going to be reading tonight. And I'd like to thank the Northern Lights staff who welcomed me into the family. It really is a family and it's just a wonderful place to be. So without further ado, we'll get going. Oh, and I forgot, John Blonick, and he's not here, but he's been the hospital administrator for years and years, and he also told me a lot of stories, which was super helpful. In places through the timeline when I have missing information, I will call it out, and again, there's chocolate. 
<laughs> All right. So starting with early Washburn, in 1886, Washburn's equivalent of a city council appointed its first board of health officer. The village had just been getting going and had been starting to be concerned with public health, sanitation, and establishing infrastructure such as sewer, water, and gas lighting. There were no hospital facilities at this time. In 1887, according to Ruth Van Stone's account of the medical history of Washburn, Ashland opened its first hospital that year. At the time, we had a lot of these handsome fellows running around the community. And we didn't have a lot of, um, we didn't have bathing facilities, we didn't have sewer, we didn't have water. There was a lot of, of human use of the area. And um, we also didn't have a, a way to pay for uh, medical care. So this is really fun. An early insurance plan, agents sold tickets to the lumberjacks for three to $10 I guess it depended on which day and how much, I don't know, the price might have varied. But they would, that would allow the holder of the ticket for six months in any hospital for surgery, food, and bed care. So that was self-insurance at the time. The Heinz Lumber Company was the first one to have group health insurance, and they started a group insurance plan that employees who didn't have a ticket somewhere else would pay 25 cents a week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly every lumberjack pu um, purchased a ticket, and the Heinz Lumber Company employees, most of them also um, went into this fund. So that, that when the employees of, <clears throat> and the lumberjacks could self-fund their medical care, that's what kept hospitals open. This is, uh, this is before 1917, because you'll see the Washburn, Hosp I mean, the Washburn Hotel there. And it, I think it burned. Susan, did it burn down in 1917 or sometime in that frame? Anyway, Washburn opened its first hospital in 1887. Local physicians, doctors Heslop and Neville. The building was located between the Norman House and the George Mertz building, which is formerly the first location of the stake pit. Do you, are you visioning where that might be? I think it's a, a yeah. No, not this stake pit. There was an earlier stake pit. I didn't know that either. Yeah, near Patsy's, and I think it's a vacant lot at this time. The hospital opened, and then it closed in 1888 due to financial troubles. Articles say that the physician that opened it left in the dark of night. I wonder if he owed somebody something. And though the village council wanted to improve public health, no one could agree on how to fund it. Placing public funds into it was highly contested among the... Uh, village leaders. In 1890, the population of Washburn was about 4,000, not including the men working in the logging camps. At this time, Washburn had no hospital and citizens had to go to Ashland for medical care. Bear with me while my mouse is... Okay. A new hospital was opened on the Sheridan block on Bayfield Street. The hospital in 1900, the, uh, the hospital advertised one and all come and enjoy the new baths at this hospital for 25 cents. Washburn had been boasting about its pristine water and comparing it to Ashland. The town leaders hoped that better sanitation and access to bathing would reduce outbreaks of smallpox and diphtheria that were raging through the area. Unfortunately, the hospital closed within two years, again from lack of funds. The years brought many doctors to the um, community, including Dr. Leonard, Dr. Coburn, Dr. Roman, Dr. Lampson, Dr. Mitchell, and Dr. Spears. They all were able to put up businesses in the main street, and many of them worked where Avel's bookstore is right now. These doctors treated their people in their offices, but if a patient needed something more extreme, they had to go to Ashland Hospital. In 1903 to 05, Washburn's dynamite industry was born. The Washburn Times reported that moneyed men from Chicago and the East invested half a million in the new enterprise. The investment group was called Atlantic Manufacturing, but they actually had no manufacturing experience. They partnered with Eastern Dynamite Company, part of the E.I. DuPont Nemours Powder Company. DuPont built and operated the plant, which was named the Barksdale Works, after its manager. The plant employed up to 2,000 men, adding a significant population to our town. This new industry began the boom and bust, no pun intended, <laughs> periods of Washburn's economic history, which had relied on lumber as the economic driver until this time. The business plan at this time was to supply explosives to the iron ore industry 
and DuPont's model was to locate plants closer to their clientele and in, but yet remote locations for safety. And then World War II came along. One. 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 Sorry. Oh, I knew it was one. I wrote down one. Okay. Everybody gets chocolate. <laughs> Too many. Too many. Thank you, but you got the hang of it. That's. I was testing you. <laughs> World War I came, and obviously the need for explosives changed dramatically. DuPont built the Haskell Building during World War I as the need for explosive dynamite increased, and so did the need for additional workforce. This building, and it's called the Haskell Building, I promise, it housed the um, single managers and it had a large social hall. The building is located behind Memorial Park, and you can, this is a picture from the 1930s, you can see by the car, I'm out of time frame here, but it's a great picture of the building and uh, weddings and parties and other town events were held in this hall. There was renewed growth in the community and with economic growth, but the war ended suddenly in 1918 and then came the Great Depression and it impacted our town. At the time, in 1918, many doctors treated patients for long-term convalescence in their own homes. This is the home today of Dr. Axley, who eventually became the owner of the Washburn Hospital. This is before that time, and he used to have a large porch that some people remember um, people convalescing on, um, which it's not shown here, but this is the house, and thanks, Sandy, for taking the picture yesterday. In 1918, the dreaded influenza came to the country. Washburn, like all communities, were affected. To care for the number of ill, the town converted the local Garfield School, which was located on Bay Bayfield Street, West Bayfield Street, into a hospital. I have a little question there, which is hard to read, but is it true or false that influenza epidemic of 18, uh, 1918 killed more people than died in World War I? Yes. Yes, yes it's true. <clears throat> so there's the um, Garfield School. This is the, it brings us to the next period of history. So as DuPont's building was not, kind of going into disuse, they didn't need it. They had a lot of people leaving the community for different reasons. Um, in 1922, there's the building again. Dr. A. A. Axley, a physician in town, purchased that building from DuPont. He was the plant doctor, by the way. He purchased this building in 1922 with the intention to open a private hospital. DuPont didn't need it anymore for boarding, and this marked the beginning of 80 years of continuous medical service care in Washburn. Dr. Axley operated the hospital as a private enterprise until he died in 1935. His wife continued, oh, I forgot one thing. There he is. And he's with Evelyn Woolland McManus. Does anyone know Evelyn? Did anyone know Evelyn? Okay. And we don't know who the baby is. We're not sure. Was it her baby, Sandy? We don't know. So Dr. Axley operated the hospital as a private enterprise until he died in 1935. His wife continued to manage the hospital until she retired in 1942. At this time, there were a number of employees called to military service for World War II. Two. <laughs> and people were in they felt the concern that we were going to lose the hospital in our town. So a group of interested citizens purchased the hospital and started its incorporation as a private nonprofit enterprise. This was the start of the Washburn Hospital Association, as we know it, as many people remember it. Mrs. Axley continued to manage operations, I'm sorry, until 1946 when she retired. The hospital continued to run successfully under the watchful eye of the Washburn Hospital Association. There were many managers through the years, which included Mrs. Jessie Axley, John Albers, Roy Schumacher, okay, help me out, <coughs> Jug Jopi, mm -hmm. and John Blonick. These years tell a story of remarkable achievement and service to the community. Now, I know Susan knows that she scanned these pictures for me, and I lost the little thumb drive that had the scanned pictures, but this is a picture of the, of the hospital auxiliary in 1946. And yes, those pictures were all taken at the same time. I had to look at the young girls and say, were they really the same age or the same? Were, they're wearing different clothing than their mothers. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see very well, but there's uh, hospital auxiliary members have been supporting Washburn hospitals 
for quite a long, long time. It's a great tradition, and we have an active auxiliary right now. The Washburn Hospital was of a timber-framed construction, and over the years, between 1922 and 68, 1922 to 1968, there were two major additions or renovations made. At one time, many of the rooms were furnished by churches and lodges and civic groups. Much of, of its successful operation over time can be credited to the men and women who provided volunteer labor and funds. Um, oops, sorry. Volunteer labor and funds. Okay, that's it. So here's some renovation. Um, this, as you remember, the building had, didn't have this big structure on it. This was a renovation during the 50s. And this is how it looks, closer to how it looks today. Who worked in this building? Just two of you? No one else worked in this, okay. Sandy was telling me the basement was creepy. Um, when, when they did renovate it, they had a modern lab and a modern uh, waiting room, which looks very modern. And they updated their surgery. Do you remember these windows? Those of you who worked in there, did anyone have surgery in this room? <laughs> it also had an updated kitchen and a very dedicated staff. So this is Olga Tast and Jesse Sheridan and some twins. This is Barb Kirshner. That's my aunt. Aunt Barb. <laughs> Joyce Larson was the bookkeeper. This is Dr. John Telford and Josephine Sheridan in 1967. It's a hard picture, but I don't have a good one, so that had to go up there. And this is Drs. Larson and Guzzo, with Roy Schumacher as the manager, Josie Sheridan and Olga Task, and there's one other person in there that I couldn't identify. Anyone can identify the other woman? It looks like Clara Kieran on me. Yep, that's it. It's Clara Kieran. That's who that is. Chocolate for Jenna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> who was the World War One guy? Oh yeah, that was Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. World War One. Who am I looking for here? <laughs> Washburn Hospital float at Brownstone days, possibly, 1965. This is Evelyn McManus, Josie Sheridan, and Olga Tast. In 1966, the Washburn Hospital Association hired John Blonick as administrator. And I wish John were able to be here tonight. He couldn't. But he was the hospital administrator during some really big times for this organization. And so we'd like to honor and thank that commitment. Oops, I'm sorry, he shouldn't be there. But this is Dr. Crozer, who is still working at the Bayfield Mount County Memorial Hospital, and he just popped in the wrong place in my slideshow. We'll go back to him later. <laughs> so now we enter a new era. This is 1968 and um, to 1980. This is the dawning of the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital. Who's worked there? Who's had babies there? Who's had surgery there? <laughs> the same people. Don Christensen's waving his hand. So in 1968, members of the Washburn Hospital Association, remember they were still running the Washburn Hospital, purchased a 10-acre tract of land that Don and Ann are going to recognize. Isn't this your barn? Yes, it is. Okay. And your house? Yep. Yeah, your house is there too. This tract of land is on the northeastern edge of Washburn, and they had the intention to work with Bayfield County Board to plan and build a state-of-the-art hospital. Bayfield County agreed to issue 750000 in bonds for the project, which had a full estimated cost of just over $2 million. Other funds were raised for the project, and this was spearheaded by the Association Board and the Administrator, John Blunick. So this is fun. This is the plan at the time, and many of you may have seen these plans if you were around in 1968. So this was the, obviously the layout and the, um, the architect's rendering of what it would look like. Breaking ground. Benny Ride and Alvin Bratley. Isn't there a Bratley in here today? Yeah. 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 Is this your dad? That's my dad. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
This is more breaking ground pictures. Um, so this was, and I thought that was a really great truck. But this is 1968. That's an old truck in 1968. And this is the front facade that you are from anybody. So it's, it's not on the main drag anymore. It's back set on Superior Street. Um, if you go to Memorial Park and take a left, head up the hill a little bit and you'll see it. And this is as it's just finishing construction. And this is the facade that you're used to. So new articles at the time stated, under this plan for this new hospital, the Washburn Hospital will become the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital, continuing to operate as a nonprofit enterprise. Its new name reflected the optimism and partnership of the community and a grander, larger vision of service to Bayfield County residents. It promised to be the most up-to-date medical facilities, and the Washburn Hos Hospital Association Board contributed the 10-acre land, modern equipment that was going to be moved from the old hospital to the new one, and $250,000 in cash. The Hospital Association would pay a monthly fee to... Um, ooh, hold on. I'm going to just change slides here. Oh, a monthly fee that would cover the bond debt over 10 to 15 years was their goal. So this is Olga too, Olga Tass. This is Doc Telford. Who's this? Gail Conklin. Gail Conklin. And anyone can guess who these people are there in the audience right now. <laughs> Doris Milanowski. And some employees were honored. So we, they, we have books and books and books of pictures during this time frame. And it's really neat. Um, John Blonick was responsible, I think, for keeping most of these pictures going. In 1970, the building was finished, and then in 1974, the hospital board decided to add on the physician's clinic, and that's when Don came, right? Is, did you come in 70? Did you come in 80? Okay. Well, in 1974, they decided to add a physician's clinic, and they named it the John J. Hopkins Clinic. And John Christensen and Ed Vandenberg joined the team in 80 or around there. The medical history of Washburn would not be complete without the story of nursing homes, and uh, we're getting to intermission already, which is great. Um, would not be complete without the story of nursing homes, which over the years gave the elderly much needed care. We'll continue this presentation about Northern Lights after the intermission, and then we'll have slides during the intermission that'll be quiet, but we're gonna have our singer back. And the slides are of our most recent um, family fair that we had in August on the Northern Lights campus. And the rest of the uh, presentation after the intermission will be about Northern Lights. Thank you, and go enjoy the bar. In the second half of this, we're going to be talking about nursing home history in the region and also Northern Lights, which is our, that's why I'm here. So let's get going. The nursing home history started in 1949. The first nursing home, this was a picture again taken by Sandy, one of the Sandys, yesterday. The first nursing home in 1949, records show that it was located on 11 East Omaha Street, located behind Bradley's funeral home. Do you guys recognize this building? It was a large building sold by Miss Della Christensen, who operated it as a boarding house, to Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Zielsdorf. And they purchased it from her and opened it as a nursing home. And for the next 10 years, from 1949 to 1959, it was the only place that offered this type of care in Washburn, and the building that we think is now vacant. In 1959, the need for the care for the elderly had increased. In, in 1958, the Bayfield County, finance, or Bayfield County financed a building of a new nursing home operated by the county at an estimated cost of $200,000. Can you imagine? Oh. New construction was completed on 117 East 6th Street. 
across from the courthouse. So there's an aerial, this is a more modern view of the, of the, and it was across from St. Louis School as well. So here's the construction, 200,000. Clarence L. Olson was the county board chairman at that time. Was this an Olson that you all know? No? Okay. There's so many Olsons. I know him, but not really. The new nursing home was the first public building in Washburn heated by liquefied petroleum uh, gas. Here's St. Louis School in the building coming up. And Miss Edith Wooland was the head nurse. And this is her on opening day. She had been working as a Bayfield County nurse for 10 years prior, and she's hired here as the nurse manager. More than 1,000 people attended the opening. The building was modern, and it operated for 20 years. <coughs> Esther Herbert and Ann Eliason, Annie Eliason. The county closed it, though, due to lack of operating funds. Its size was inefficient. This building is now the Bayfield County Annex, across from the courthouse. You recognize it? Who worked there? Yay! Okay, I, I'm not giving this out very well, so husband. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, who gets chocolate? This nice lady next to Anne. Nineteen eighty was the birth of Northern Lights. An agreement was reached between the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital Board. Remember, Bayfield County Memorial Hospital is a nonprofit operating with that name. It's a little confusing. And this is why I'm standing here, actually. I was hired to uh, do grant writing for the organization, and I needed to know the organizational history, and I kept saying, well, was it run by Bayfield County? Was it, you know, and I didn't know. And who thought, who else was confused? <laughs> right. But anyway, they were partners in this project. An agreement was reached with between the nonprofit Bayfield County Memorial um, Hospital Board and Bayfield County, lots of Bayfields in that, to build a new 86-bed nursing home facility onto the east wing of the Bayfield County Memorial Hospital. The estimated cost of construction of the new facility was $2.5 million. It included four wings in the shape of a cross, two of which are two-story with basements, and this is the current facility used today by Northern Light Services. The project was largely funded by an issuance of bonds from Bayfield County. On the day it opened, 31 residents moved from the old nursing home facility that was run by the county into this new facility, and another 21 additional new residents. So here's a chocolate moment for y'all. <laughs> Who came up with the name Northern Lights? Oh, come on. The whole purpose for me learning was this moment. <laughs> According to Dolores Meshevitz, do you know Dolores Meshevitz? She wrote an article, she wrote several articles in the newspaper um, during this period. She said the name came from residents at the time in the old nursing home, and when they were considering making a move, um, people had approached them to say, let's have a contest for the new name, and that Northern Lights was the new name. Did you say that? Contest. Chocolate. <laughs> You're going to be really jacked up. Do you want some grand? <laughs> and they moved patients all in one day, right? Was I right about that? Sandy Olson's grandmother moved there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it took a couple of days. Two days, maybe. It was really oh. fast. So, um, and they did it with cars and everything, and it just, everyone moved. So, that uh, Bayfield County Memorial Hospital in, 19, in 1988 closed its doors. But let's look at, um, just before that, here's, here's the new nursing home. And one thing I'll tell you, working there this year, is there are so many smiling faces all the time. 
every day. It is a great place to visit if you're feeling blue. Go over there and just hang out with the residents because they're a lot of fun and the staff. This is a uh, letter from Ronald Reagan. Can you read this at all from where you are? It says, congratulations, Miss Gibson. This is May Gibson on the occasion of her 106th birthday. He says, Nancy and I are delighted to send our warmest wishes on your special day and our hopes for continued joys and blessings. Sincerely, Ronald Reagan. And I guess Miss May, Miss Gibson said, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> Okay, see, we have fun. This is uh, the acute care um, helicopter, which didn't go to Duluth. It went somewhere else, and I can't remember where. But they, they're taking residents on helicopter tours <laughs> from the parking lot. We need to do this. We need to do this. This is in the 80s. Does anyone know Laurel Gilbert? Yes, this is her. So Laurel Gilbert was another very long-standing, you know, positive person that worked for Northern Lights during this time frame. So this is where I was asking about the name. But then again, we had another contest. Jennifer said it was in the 2000s, and that was for what is our motto? What is the motto of kind of the byline of what, mean, what Northern Lights means? And it was they cared for us and we care for them. Who's, who came up with it? Stephanie. Jackie, do you know? No. So I, one of the things that attracted me to Northern Lights was this motto. I thought that was just super special. Oops. Okay. In 1988, Bayfield County Memorial Hospital ends its acute care program. And I know it was financial. And I remember graduating from graduate school at Madison and going to work in a, me a mental health hospital at the time, DePaul Hospital in Milwaukee. And in 1988-89 was the beginning of the HMO. And I think maybe something like that happened. Yeah? Dr. Christensen, do you have any insights? Financial. So, after the hospital closed its acute care, the Bayfield County Board um, okayed a sale of the hospital to a physician's group that purchased the hospital facilities, and Northern Lights continued to operate on its own under that original incorporation that Washburn Hospital had in 1937 as a nonprofit organization. And that was what I was looking for. Where did that go? Because when we get our IRS documents for things that I do, it says 1937. So, Northern Lights took that on and kept going, and we're still going. And now I have a lot of pictures to show you. This is Northern Lights through the years. These are the 1990s to 2000. And again, do you guys see the kitten? <laughs> this is an animal kind of place. When I'm there, there are pets and dogs and cats, and I love it. It's just amazing. This is the Central Nurses Station. The hair salon. Bernice. Bernice. It looks a little different. Looks a little, look at this fashion. Look at the fashion of the guy, you know. <laughs> Bernice is our, our hairdresser. Uh, this is blurry, but oh, come on. She's dancing with the Easter Bunny. She looks a little concerned. <laughs> This is the living room, the family room with the fireplace. And now I'm going to tell Sandy, uh, Sandy Johnson's story because she won't tell it. But that's in the front room. Okay. Sure. So when Northern Lights built, was built, it didn't have a dining hall and a kitchen. It did not. So does anyone know where Curves is and now it's called something else? It's called... Go figure. Help. Go figure. Go figure. Um, that area used to um, be the dining room for the Northern Lights residents. And so Sandy was telling me how three times a day, Naomi, they had to bring everybody down to that spot from upstairs. So that's elevators, that's, you know, that's just a big parade of people three times a day. Yeah? <laughs> Jennifer recalls. Jackie, were you? Did you do that? No, I 
so a little bit. I think we have built a new dining room. And they didn't have a kitchen in the, nor the Northern Light side either. So that was all supplied by the Bay Bayfield County Memorial Hospital side, who would then, there had to be staff members that would go get the food and then wheel it, you know, over to this other location. Three times a day, 365 days a year. That was, I mean, that's enough activity. You probably didn't have an activities program. <laughs> Our veterans are still, they still meet, they still have these meet. This is just, like this could have happened yesterday. And then, can I just tell you the number of children I see in the hallways of Northern Lights is phenomenal. This is, I think it's a Christmas scene, I think. They look a little like shepherds. And they're attentively watching their teacher. Um, they still have toddler time once a month. And these, to oh, it's the cutest thing ever. Quilts. Anyone make quilts for residents? This is a big thing. It's been going on a long, long time at Northern Lights, and it's still, it still it started a long time ago. It continues. Here's the 90s. Here's the front of the Northern Lights building. Staff from around 1990, maybe? Depending on the haircut, maybe. Bernice can tell us. Joanne Fenn and Ray Payday. Ministry. Someone got married. Volunteers. Chris. Rick and Chris. This is Hazel Bodine. Again, cat. I mean, can I just tell you that there's a like, we have goats in there sometimes. <laughs> Violet Buck. Eva Pearson. Ruby Strang. See, there's a goat. <laughs> and the quilts again. And the quilts come and come and come. A little more modern history here. <laughs> Teresa and Jean, right? Oh, sorry. <coughs> I love this picture. <laughs> And their activities. I was I was had the pleasure of joining the crowd going on their activities this summer. I think this is um, Apple Fest. This is the Bayfield um, Pavilion. This is Halloween. 101 Dalmatians, literally. Corella <laughs> DeVille was one of our activities. Bob Unger is here. And I did this just for Sandy. <laughs> the staff dress up too. There's Bob. Again, it's just wonderful and they trick-or-treat so at Halloween time um, we open the doors for trick-or-treating at all of the different parts of our facility we have the Oaks now as well and kids come by and do trick-or-treating early they bring in activities they bring in experts they bring in lectures <laughs> who's that oh. that's your railroad train that's your train chocolate for you <laughs> sorry I'm really bad obviously <laughs> This is Christmas, the night before Christmas? Um, that was actually a talent show. Oh, it was a talent show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the staff members dressed up. Yeah. Dance lessons? I could use that. So I just want to tell you the smiles and the faces and the children. This is Christmas because we're wearing reindeer head. Beautiful facilities. When I walked in there, I didn't realize that we had local artists all over the walls. It is, and the art changes periodically. There's a picture I'd really like to buy. It's like pressure. Valentine's Day is coming. Valentine's and birthday. But it's, it's really a special place. So local artist Jan Wise, I don't think she's here tonight, but several artists. Anyone else have art hanging on the wall in there? Or no of our, yes, Ann Christensen has art in there. What else happens in the hall? Who's walking to Mackinac Bridge? Who are our walkers? Oh, come on, I know you're a walker. Yeah, 
So um, we have a community walking program, and so that people come in from the cold, like days like today, and walk the halls. And if you do, how many miles is it to Mackinac? 1,500 miles? No, it's not that far. How many miles are you going for? 360. 360. 365 if you cross the bridge. <laughs> Chocolate to who's gone the furthest? <laughs> What's your mileage so far? Do you, are you keeping track? Hank here. Hank. What's your mileage? About 70. What is 70 it? miles? 70 miles so far? Where is he? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be working against your body. Oh, good. We're motivated. And I don't know if you know this, but this is our old logo. Uh, we have a newer logo than this, but this was a, a, a logo out on our sign. I have more. And another thing that happened... Um, a lot of people wonder what all the buildings are around Northern Lights, so I thought I'd take a minute and show you what's going on there. So there's a, uh, the Long-Term Health Care Center, which you saw and you're familiar with, that was built in 1980. Um, the Oaks Residence and Rehabilitation Therapies are also now a part of Northern Lights. And we've used some of that basement space and we've reconfigured some things, and in the 2000s we built an assisted living facility, all attached and on these grounds. Did you know that we were a five-star facility? We earned our five stars this year from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. <laughs> Has anyone been there for outpatient therapy? Broken something? I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's not fun, but it's, it's nice. It's a beautiful facility. They do outpatient resi and residential therapies for our long-term care and rehabilitation um, parent, um, patients, as well as people like me. My daughter was there for a while getting something done. So they have um, OT, PT, speech, massage therapy, and low vision programs. So think about Northern Lights. And this is the entrance to the rehabilitation center. So this, this complex was added onto in the, in the 2000s. 2007. 2007, thanks. Chocolate. <laughs> and this is the Oaks. It supports 16 full-time residents. It's an assisted living program, and it's a beautiful home environment. Does anyone know anyone? Have you been in here? Yes, the Oaks? Yay. Good. This is the inside of the uh, OTPT area. Who's here? And we do have short-term rehabilitation care as well. So if something goes wrong in your life and you need a place to stay for a little bit, we're there for you. And long-term skilled nursing, which is what we started with. Again, the activities are robust to all abilities and ages and interests. We still have toddler time. Can I tell you about this? <laughs> Murphy is our activities director. Um, said, now you got to come out to the shooting range. This is him there helping um, Teresa. And she's given us permission to use this picture. And Teresa has her glasses. <laughs> and she can shoot anything. She's a dead shot. <laughs> she said that when she was a young kid, she used to shoot squir red squirrels or something. Anyway, her parents paid her for chipmunks or red squirrels, one of those little hefty things. So she's, she could just shoot anything. It was a phenomenal day. But when she sat back down, she said, whose sunglasses are these? <laughs> she was awesome. And I was amazed. <laughs> I was amazed that the activities directors were taking the residents out target shooting and ice fishing possibly, and we're looking at dog sledding. So if you think you still have some bucket list ideas, we're not resting over there at Northern Lights. We are doing those bucket list things. And I, it was one of mine. I got to shoot an a antique um, gun that day, and I hadn't done that before, so that was pretty cool. Fishing. And we are working hard to share the light with the community. Northern Lights, sharing the light, you can kind of see this is my job, this is how I get. Um, 
but we did have an outdoor tree lighting um, ceremony this year to just honor the care and love that people give to each other. It could be current or past. And uh, we'll do that again next year, and it was a really beautiful, beautiful night. So there's our tree. It looks a little like the Grinch who stole Christmas, I should sing. <laughs> And now I'm going to ask Jennifer to come up here. Jennifer Augustine is the executive director, and she's going to say a few words about the future. And before we end tonight, if we have time, I'd like to call on a couple people I know have some great stories about these facilities and this time frame. So hang in there. And here's Jennifer. So for those who don't know me, can you hear me back there? Um, I'm Jennifer Augustine. I'm the current administrator at Northern Light Services. February 1st, or I should say 2018, um, started my 16th uh, year at Northern Light. Six of those, this is my sixth year as administrator. The rest were as director of nursing services at Northern Light. And I have to tell you that um, I, I am not from this area. I am from down by Milwaukee in the Waukesha area. And um, I moved up to this area. I met my husband and married him. He's a lifelong resident of this area. Um, I'm, I hope I married him because he is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, the sense of community, the sense of um, this whole area, the Shawamigan Bay region, but particularly um, Washburn and, and the communities surrounded, surrounding have really, um, it, it's very impactful. Um, the, the care and the compassion that I see um, by families, by my staff, um, has really made uh, Northern Lights a place that I am very, very proud of. Uh, we have, uh, in my opinion, the best team um, around in the area, and our, our goal is to provide the people who choose to live in our organization, the community members that we're sitting next to tonight or who know, who have a family member, it, it's our mission, it's our job to make sure we take the best care we can of them. So I thank my staff, and I thank all of you, and I thank those who use our services. Um, our services are going to be much needed in the future. Um, I, I'm the person who has to talk a little bit about the future um, as far as what our demographics look like. And this here is a, a population projection. Over on the left, you'll see what our current county population is, or in 2015, Bayfield County's population um, of those citizens, no, that's just regular population, not citizens over 65. <coughs> What is 15,000. And as you see um, over the years till we get to 2040, our population um, does go down a bit. The reason for that is because our population in Bayfield County of those residents 65 and older continues to go up. Um, in 20, uh, our current uh, population of resi uh, residents in the county that are 65 and older is 3,800. By 2020, we expect that to be at over, almost 5,000, at 4,720. In 2025, 5,645. 2030, just over 6,000. 2035 and 2040, it starts to dip again. That's a lot of people that may need to use long-term assisted living or outpatient services in that, in that age group. You can see the... How do you do that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> You can see I have two other slides here, and in there, in 2010, 21% of the population was 65 or older, looking at Bayfield County. In 2040, 44% of that population will be 65 or older. And you can see on the slide, you may have seen these before, Bayfield County is that bright, bright blue. Um, our population um, of our mature adults are gonna be much higher than the average. And here's 2040. Northern Wisconsin in general is going to be a higher um, population of older adults, but Bayfield County really is, uh, it, you can see it very well there. Do you have another slide after that? Okay. So now I was going to do it before this, but I, I'm not good at this, so I'll just um, tell you. I will tell you a few other facts about Northern Lights. Um, just we talked about it as far as the history goes, which was very interesting, and I didn't know a lot of the history either. Um, we still uh, coordinate with Bayfield County. 
when we put the addition onto Northern Lights, the assisted living, the rehab, and remodeled the nursing home, that was all done in 2000 and 2007 and 2008. That was done by borrowing bonds through Bayfield County like they've done throughout the history of Northern Lights and the Bayfield County Hospital. Um, and then we pay that back as a mortgage. Um, we, have, we are a not-for-profit. So we do not get funding from any other source other than that comes from our residents. 75% of that revenue comes from state and federal funds. As a private employer, we employ 170 of our community members, um, 170 plus, that's a lot of community members to uh, employ. And through our different services, our home health services, last year we served over 200 clients in their homes providing close to 20,000 home visits. Um, we see, um, I should have got the exact numbers as far as how many admissions and discharges. We see 30 to 40 people, different people who come through our outpatient clinic every month. Maybe it's even a little higher than that. Um, but we serve a lot of people and we, we want to continue doing that. Um, for 100 years, this community really has provided for health um, and wellness services to them to its members. And as we reminisce about the past and learning about those services, um, it really is a foundation for us thinking uh, about the future and the continued support of our, com our community and the Shawamigan Bay region. We just don't serve those people directly in this community, although that's the most of them. We, s we serve as people from Ashland County, Sawyer County. Our home health agency extends into Sawyer County. Um, and, the, and the organization, um, our goal is to assure that we can continue to provide high quality services that will meet the needs of these changing demographics. And again, I just think it's very important that we look back at that history because it really has been a pillar of the community as a not-for-profit, either a hospital or a nursing home, or giving baths to the lumberjacks, I guess, um, that this is where we are now. So, thank you. People, I'd call on you because you have really great stories and you're sitting around a table of six or eight chairs and not everyone can hear your stories. So I want to ask um, Doc Christensen and his wife or either or to come tell there's something about geese. <laughs> and you, the only rule is you can't put the microphone in front of you. So I'm Ann Christensen and um, we moved to Washburn in 1981, 80, and um, moved to our little farm, though, in 1981. So we bought the farm just beyond the nursing home. And um, we have three kids, and all of our kids really loved animals. So we had tons of animals uh, at our farm. And the kids would um, just grab a chicken or grab a rabbit or grab a pony and just go over to the nursing home. And the, the knock on the door and somebody would let them in. Mariah one time took her pony. She had a little uh, uh, POA pony um, named Buster. And she uh, put his bridle on him and put him on a, on a leash and took him over there and walked him all through the nursing home and everyone was just totally okay about that. that. That was no problem. Do you want to tell about the geese? So uh, for those that, I, I'm not sure if the problem is solved right now, but in the spring, the, the, the north side of the parking lot really floods and, and we always used to have geese and we don't have a whole lot of water up by our house, it's pretty dry. And so our geese would migrate down to the parking lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, geese are, you know, they're not the nicest creatures in the world. <laughs> so you get this call saying, Matt, you come and get your geese, you know, they're chasing you away from the nursing home parking lot. <laughs> but I think one of the, the, the fun things about the, the nursing home, and it's, you know, Jennifer, it continues this, that way. It's so open to, to kids and stuff like that. And uh, I used to be a doctor over there at the hospital, and, and I always do my nursing home rounds with kids because it was, it was real easy for me with doing it with kids. When I went just as a doctor, then I'd hear about constipation and all <laughs> back pain and all the stuff like that. You take your kids, none of that. <laughs> and it was pretty good, and people were happy. So. <laughs> and some of you are probably here for this. Um, 
raise your hand if, do you remember when the guy dropped off the sheep there? Do you remember that, Sandy? So, so I was home, and I get this phone call. I don't remember who called, but somebody said, we need some help over here. Could you, would you mind coming over to the nursing home? So Mariah, my daughter Mariah and I ran over there, and um, the director of the, of the nursing home at that time, who was that? Yeah, he was in a suit and tie, and he had a big broom. And, uh, and you know, there's this little sort of decorative fence right outside of the nursing home. And they had taken a hose and woven the hose through this decorative fence to make it a more stable fence. And there were maybe three or four bales of straw or hay just covering the place. And there were four sheep in there and the director was had a big broom and he was trying to keep the sheep inside of this little you know not really a, a container thing and somebody had been this is how kind they are over there so somebody had been driving through port wings saw some sheep out in a in a field bought them put them in the back of his station wagon brought them to the nursing home and said would you do you think the residents would like to watch these sheep <laughs> out there with a broom, trying to keep the sheep in the, in the decorative fence. And, um, and so we, at one point in our career, thought we were going to have sheep. Luckily, we didn't. But we had these movable sheep fences. So we ran home, got the movable sheep fences, which you can kind of stick in the ground. And I don't know how we herded the darn sheep into that. But so then the sheep were grazing in the grass outside the nursing home. The guy did not come back to pick up his sheep until... The next day? Or so. Oh, yeah. And maybe it was even a couple of days. And he said, these were my love pets. Where did you put them? And I think by that time, they had gone to the dog pound. Didn't they? <laughs> but I mean, this is the kind of... This is the kind of place it is where people can drop off sheep. <laughs> you can walk through with a pony. <laughs> so, Don's, Don's parents were both in, in the nursing home and the Oaks. And... Our experience was just fabulous. People couldn't have been more loving and more kind to them in their old days. We've come to the end of the hour-long presentation. I promise not to hold people captive, but please continue to reminisce and find each other. And is there anyone else that wants to say anything before we end? <laughs>